Hi everyone, my name is Beth. I'm a librarian at the Weinberg Library in Mequon, and my topic today is being safe online. So I'm going to talk about some of the ways that you can keep yourself safe from scammers, including both spammers and phishing scammers, um, as well as ways to avoid downloading or installing any kinds of viruses or malware that you may encounter as you move around the internet. So I will focus on email safety, then I'll talk about how to be safe as you just kind of putter around and do different things online. And then we'll talk a little bit about passwords and where you can find out some more information about how to be safe. As always, the handout for this is in the description below. So feel free to take a look at it because it covers a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about. Now, before I dive into specifics, I should probably outline what sorts of threats you might face online. So for the most part, there's not that much out there that can hurt you these days. Most websites are set up to protect you um, from things like viruses and malware. Most browsers that you'll use, things like Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or Edge, um, have built-in protection as well. They'll protect you from things like pop-ups, and they'll block you from going to websites that they think are unsafe. Websites like Amazon and different places where you'll put in your credit card information or personal information are encrypted. So people who are watching what you're doing over like um, a Wi-Fi connection won't be able to see what you enter, all kinds of stuff. If none of that makes a ton of sense, that's really okay because you don't really have to know. You don't have to worry about it. Um, as long as your passwords are strong and you're being responsible, you can be pretty safe on the internet. That being said, there are folks out there, scammers, who make it their job to target your financial information and try to get it from you by sending you emails that you can't trust and by sending you to websites that you can't trust. So they will be looking to get things like your email address, passwords for various accounts that you might have, your credit or debit card number, your social security number, which they would then use to make fake credit cards in your name um, and charge a bunch of money and then leave you with the bill, things like that. So they are constantly on the lookout for people to take advantage of. And what I'd like to do today is make sure that you don't become one of those people. So let's talk about being safe in your email. One of the things you wanna look out for is something called phishing. And this is when you get a message that claims it's from a company you know and trust, but it actually isn't. So you might get an email from your bank, for example, or at least it looks like it's from your bank, but in the email they say, hey, we need to know your login information so we can get in and do something on your account. Can you tell me your username and your password? You reply with your username and password. It turns out that email wasn't from your bank at all, and now someone has logged into your bank account and copied down your debit card number and is using it to buy things online. Another kind of scam you might run into in email is spam. These are emails that are from strangers, and they may say, I'm selling something really interesting, or hey, I have money that I wanna send you. Can you tell me some of your financial information so I can send you this product or so that I can, you know, ex I can send you the money that I'm promising? So these are the two big sort of categories of scam emails that you wanna watch out for. In particular, when you open emails from anyone, but especially from people you don't know or addresses you don't recognize, you wanna be wary of suspicious requests. So when it comes to phishing, reputable companies like banks and shopping sites and places that you can really trust will never, never, ever ask for your private information by email. They don't need your login information under any circumstances because they can always see stuff from the back end that's in your account. Um, the only time you may be asked for something like a social security number is if you're calling your bank and they need to verify your identity. Um, nobody should be calling you or emailing you and asking for these very private details. And then when it comes to, to actual spam, to people who might email you out of the blue and say, hey, can I send you some money? If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, unfortunately, strangers don't just offer other strangers cash with no strings attached. And in this case, the strings are that they will clean you out and leave you destitute. Be wary also of strange URLs. So URLs are the links that you use to navigate the internet. Um, every website on the internet has a URL. Um, you can preview URLs in browsers by mousing over it, by putting your cursor over it, and then a small preview will show up in the bottom left corner of the screen. So let me get over to somewhere that I can show you. So as an example, 
I'm here now on our catalog, the library catalog, and I'm going to mouse over the Weinberg Library website. And now in the very bottom left corner of the screen, you can see I've got a little pop-up, www.flwlib.org. And I know that stands for Frank L. Weinberg Library.org. So if you got an email claiming to be from your bank, let's say you bank with Associated Bank, you get an email that says, we're from your bank and we need you to click on this link right here to go and log into your account for some reason. If you mouse over where it says, you know, click here to go to this site, if you, if you put your cursor over that and then look in the bottom left corner of the screen and it doesn't say like associatedbank.com or associatedbank.org, especially if it just has a random string of numbers and letters, it's probably not legitimate and you shouldn't click on it. And in fact, you should just delete the email altogether. Um, so mousing over a link before you click on it is a good way to be safe. Also pay attention to spelling and grammatical errors, um, especially from companies because most companies do their best to um, write cleanly and clearly. So if you're reading it and it doesn't quite sound right um, or it sounds off, it's probably not trustworthy, just disregard. Also take a look at the email address that the email came from. Um, again, if it's random strings of letters and numbers, definitely not reputable and you should just disregard it. And also just like with URLs, if the email is from quote unquote associated bank, but the address, the email address is not something at associatedbank.com, it's probably not actually from them. It's from some random person who was trying to trick you, just disregard. As a rule, when you're looking at your email, do not open emails from people or addresses that you don't recognize. Don't open attachments on emails from anyone you don't recognize because they might contain viruses, which we'll talk more about in a minute. I referenced this earlier, but don't click on links from anyone you don't recognize. Always preview a link before you click on it because if you click on it and it's not legitimate, first of all, it might take you to something called a spoofed site, which really looks like the site that you thought you were going to. So again, going back to the Associated Bank example, they say click here to log into your account. You go to this page, it looks like Associated Bank, it seems right, but then you put in your username and your password and that actually sends that information to the scammer who then uses it to break into that account and steal your information. Or the link might take you to a site where a virus would be installed on your computer. Again, more about that in a second. And then finally, do not ever, ever email anyone your financial information. There's no reason for a reputable company to ask you for it. Your friends and family shouldn't really be asking you for it either because email is not a safe way to communicate that information. So you shouldn't ever put it in writing or send it out as an email. On the opposite hand, as a rule, do delete suspicious emails or emails from addresses you don't recognize. If you open an email and something about it doesn't sit right with you, just get rid of it. And if you go into your inbox and you see an email from an address and you're like, I don't know who that is, just get rid of it. It's just like spam in your mailbox. Don't even think about it. And then if you're not totally sure about a, a suspicious message, if you open something and you're like, I don't think this is right, but maybe it's real and I better check, follow up directly with the company or the organization that supposedly sent it. And ideally, use a different form of contact to do it. So don't email back and say, are you for real? Call them and ask them over the phone, speaking to a human being, is this an actual thing? And ideally, use a phone number that you get from an official document. So if you're getting these weird emails from quote unquote associated bank, find a bank statement or look at your debit card and call the number on the back of that card or on the bank statement. Don't call a number that's listed in the weird email because then that may also be spoofed and it may not be legitimate. So that is email safety. Now let's talk about malware and viruses and other things like that. So malware, viruses, spyware, ransomware, these are all words that refer to dangerous programs made by amateur computer specialists or by scammers. And they're designed to basically wreak havoc on your computer in general. Um, they can make your life difficult. And specifically, they often are intended to help scammers steal your financial information. So just like with emails, scammers will try to get you to download malware and viruses so that they can do things like watch what you're doing on your computer. And then they can see that when you go to amazon.com, you enter this credit card number, or when you go to this other website, you enter this login information, and they can then steal that and use it for their own purposes. 
Some of the places you might get a virus from include from a spam email. Opening a message does not itself put you at risk, so don't worry too much about that. If you open a message and it turns out to be suspicious, like I said earlier, just delete it. What would put you at risk is opening an attachment, because by opening it, you are basically giving the virus permission, quote unquote, to install itself on your computer, or clicking on a link in the email, because again, that gives the virus, quote unquote, permission to install itself on your computer. And then, of course, you might get a virus just from surfing the internet at large. For the most part, this is fairly rare, especially on big, well-known sites and sites that you have to subscribe to access. Things like Netflix, things like Facebook tend to be very safe. But once you get off the map a little bit, you do tend to run into some unsavory stuff. So I'm thinking of if you are Googling a problem or you're Googling a, a topic, you may end up on a website where you see a pop-up or you go to a random screen that suddenly says, oh no, your computer has a virus, we have to fix it. Things like that are not legitimate and they are not safe. And if you click within that pop-up or click on a link on that site, just like with a spam email that has a dangerous link, you may end up accidentally giving something permission to install itself on your computer that is not trustworthy and that will give your information away to a scammer. Now, the most important thing, if you stumble across a suspicious website that doesn't seem quite right to you, or you open up a pop-up by mistake, pop-ups are just little windows that pop up and click here to win a million dollars, or um, click here to fix all these problems we found in your computer, the best thing you can do is just close them. And you do that by clicking on the X in the top right or left corner of your screen. If you can't close the window, because sometimes these sites open or these pop-ups open and they don't have the X in the top right or left corner of the screen, they, they fill your screen, you can force your browser, so Chrome, Edge, Safari, whatever, to quit, and that will make the pop-up go away. So on Windows, I'll get out of here and show you, on a Windows computer, to force your browser to quit, you'd go down here to the Start menu in the bottom left corner, right click on it, and then click on Task Manager. And that's gonna open a list of the things that are currently running on your computer. So you can see I have Google Chrome, this is my browser. I'm gonna left click on it, and then say End Task. And by doing that, that will force Chrome to close then when I reopen it later, it's going to say, hey, did you want us to restore what you were doing? And I would say no, because I don't want it to reopen those things again. But that would clear, sort of clear the board and make it safe for me to go back online. If you're on a Mac, instead you're going to press the buttons Option, Command, and Escape on your keyboard, which will open up a little window, again, that'll have things listed that you're currently running. And then you would click on your browser and say Force Quit. So here's a visual of that. You're looking for the option, command, and escape keys. That opens up this window. And on a lot of Macs, you'd be clicking on Safari, but you may also be clicking on Chrome or Firefox or a different thing. Um, and that would highlight it in blue. And then you would just click force quit and it would disappear. And again, when you open it again, tell it, nope, start a new session for me so that I don't go back to that scary site. If you're on a Windows computer, you should be running an antivirus program. By default, Windows comes with Windows security, which is very good. Um, it has a strong, what's called a firewall, which will protect you from malware and viruses. And it has a good scanning program that will periodically look at your computer and make sure there's nothing on it that you need to be worried about. If you wanna know more about antivirus software, take a look at our Windows 10 ICANN video. But I just wanted to mention, an antivirus program is also a useful thing to have in this case. And the very last thing I want to talk about is passwords. So the accepted sort of industry advice is that it's safest for you to have different passwords for every single account that you have on the internet, which is really annoying and it's really inconvenient, but it is important and it does make sense. So the reason that you want to have different passwords for every one of your accounts is so that someone who breaks into one account can't get into all of them, including the really important ones. So it's one thing to say, okay, well, there's nothing important on my Pinterest account. There's nothing important on my Target account. There's a credit card number on there, but it's from years ago and it's expired now. Okay, but if someone manages to get a hold of your Target password or your Pinterest password, and it's the same as your bank account or Amazon where your credit card is stored or your other credit card account or this or that or the other, they can get into all of those accounts now because they broke into that weaker one. 
Whereas if you have different passwords for all of those accounts, they can only get into that one and then they're stuck out of the others. Now, the National Cybersecurity Alliance recommends that you actually use pass phrases rather than pass words. So rather than doing just one thing like snow 22, they say you should actually do several different words and make sure that there are at least 12 characters total. And then the FTC recommends that you add numbers and symbols to the middle of your password. The reason is that what, what typically happens with these situations is that hackers and scammers will create an AI, they'll create a software program that automatically and tries to log in using random words and random numbers. If you put in numbers and symbols in the middle, it's harder for it to guess. If you put in capital letters, it's harder for it to guess. And if you put in multiple words, that makes it even, even harder for it to guess. So we're trying to outwit not a person, but a robot. So if you think about it that way, it makes more sense to do this. Um, so some examples might be spring starts in March. It's an easy phrase. You could capitalize each of the words. That's going to make it more complicated. And then you add a symbol and a letter or the Easter parade. One of the words is capitalized. There's a number and a symbol in the middle of the word or near the middle of the word. I find that it's easiest uh, if I replace specific letters with symbols and words rather than adding them in at random. I also find that it's easiest if I have a song stuck in my head at the time that I make the password. I'll do a couple of words from a lyric and then that gives me a nice little phrase I can use and I can just throw in uh, different capitalized letters and different numbers and symbols to replace other things. Well, then the question becomes, I have all these different passwords, how do I remember them? You really don't. And by that, I mean you should write them down. Because no matter how memorable you think a password is, unless you log into that account and type that password every single day, you are probably not going to remember it. So it's a good idea to have it written down in an easily accessible place that you will think of when you need to go find it. And you'll go, oh, oh my gosh, I got to go get that. And you don't want it to be too close to your computer. Ideally, not even in your desk, certainly not taped to your monitor or to the top of the desk where anybody who walked into your house could see it. The last thing you want to have happen is someone breaks into your house, steals your computer, and they see your list of passwords in your desk and take it with them. And now they've got access to all of your accounts, right? You want them to be safe. So you want to put them somewhere that you'll think of, but not necessarily that a thief would think of. And then try your best to keep them clearly organized and label them according to which account they correspond to. So I've had a few interactions with folks who have a notebook with them and they come in and they say, this is my notebook and it's got all my notes in it of, of things and I have my passwords in here. But the passwords are on different pages or they don't say what account they're for. Again, you're not going to remember six weeks from now that that particular password corresponded to that particular account. If you write them down, write them on the same page or keep them close together and then make sure you write down which account they're for so you don't forget. If you'd like to learn more about how to stay safe online, because this is a very basic overview, check out the National Cybersecurity Alliance's webpage, staysafeonline.org. They have lots of different things and articles you can read. They also have different um, privacy tools for different websites. I didn't talk about online privacy at all because it's a huge sprawling topic, but um, if you want to learn more, you can do that there. You can also look at the FTC's Consumer Information website. They have a section for online security, and then this is the URL here. These are also in your handout, so these are very nice. These are ones, obviously, that I used when I was putting this together, and, and they're from reputable sources. And that is it. Like I said, a very quick surface level overview um, of the very basic ways you can keep yourself safe, but hopefully enough to, if you're just a basic internet user, to keep you going. Otherwise, enough to jump off of to take a look at the National Cybersecurity Alliance site and the FTC site. If you have questions, feel free to get in touch with me. Otherwise, I will see you on April 2nd at 3 o'clock for Smartphones 201 audiobooks and podcasts. See you then.